welcome. Welcome to the inaugural Hall of Fame ceremony for the University of Arizona School of Journalism. It is so wonderful to see so many of you here today uh, to support some great champions in our field. Um, and thank you all, especially to those who purchased tickets or donated on behalf of our inductees. I'm Sarah Cazell. I'm a 2011 graduate of the U of A School of Journalism. Go Cats. I am based in Phoenix now. I'm a freelancer there, so I work on a couple TV shows covering high school sports and college sports. I also do some radio for the ESPN radio affiliate on the weekends up there. And please refrain from throwing drinks or food at me. I also teach at Cronkite sometimes. <laughs> Only twice a week. Thank you. I'm John Deanna. I am a uh, 1983 graduate of the University of Arizona School of Journalism, and I'm very honored to be here. I think if you take a look around you at, at all these uh, folks who came together today, they came together for a group of very special people, and it's only this group that could have brought so many people from so far across the country here today. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, like Sarah, uh, actually, my main job is uh, I am the page one editor at the Arizona Republic. Uh, like Sarah, I also teach at Cronkite, but, but I always tell my classes that I wanted to go to ASU, but I already had a high school diploma. <laughs> My daughter, Natalie, who is a social media coordinator at uh, the Los Angeles Rams, is a 2016 U of A Journalism School graduate. And she's a third generation Wildcat, so our blood runs red and blue. Uh, I should also probably mention that uh, Sarah is the accomplished broadcast professional and accomplished public speaker. I'm here for eye candy. So. <laughs> Thanks for helping us out, John. <laughs> All right, we are here today to honor 14 individuals and two couples for their significant achievements and service to journalism and society. They include trailblazers in print and broadcast journalism, Pulitzer Prize winners, and investigative reporters who relentlessly hunt for the truth, and they're more important than ever. Uh, you've seen the inductees uh, behind us. Uh, incredible inaugural class, truly impressive. So for the next hour or so, we will be calling up each inductee uh, or family member in alphabetical order to accept their Hall of Fame plaque and say a few words. And we will ask that you keep each speech around five minutes. We won't play you off with music if you exceed that, but you know, keep it civil, guys. So uh, when we call your name, come on up. I was fortunate enough to be a couple of years behind our first uh, honoree, and he is the guy everybody wanted to be when we were in school. Tall, good looking, but beyond that, he was a terrific journalist and still is. Uh, Gilbert Bylone is, uh, was also one of my predecessors as editor-in-chief of the Wildcat, and he is now editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, he won the 2014 Ben Bradley Award uh, as the nation's top newspaper editor in, in 2014 uh, for his uh, oversight of the coverage of the Michael Bla Brown police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, that effort was also awarded the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in Photography. Gilbert is a 1981 graduate and he's past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and a former top editor of the Dallas Morning News. Gilbert Bailon. See anymore, so I need to tell you this is up here. In my resume that I s filled out my senior year at the Daily Wildcat in the basement of the Student Union, my goal that I mailed, hard copy students, to dozens and dozens of editors around the country said, I seek to become an editor of a Daily Metro. I am blessed that I've been able to achieve that goal and continue to live that dream today. As I reflect on those humble beginnings here at U of A, I extend my gratitude to so many great people who have made it possible. My romance with journalism began in middle school writing for a mimeograph school newspaper. Working my, at my high school newspaper, El Periodico, at Marcos Teniza High School in Tempe, 
It deepened my desire to write and engage in sensitive topics of journalism that we caused a lot of trouble. I became editor of my high school newspaper, which laid the bedrock of my career. But it was here at U of A that propelled me into believing I had the skills and preparation to serve as editor of the Daily Wildcat. I never would have had the internal drive to apply for that Daily Wildcat editor job if not for the persistent cajoling of Don Carson. I was a good student. I loved working with the all-star team of journalists at the Daily Wildcat, some of them here. People like Bobby Joe Buell, Sam Stanton, Judy Dunwill, Tom Nichols, Susan Carson, Bill Walsh, John Deanna, Don Rodriguez, Brian Malloy, and many others. We had an all-star team at the Daily Wildcat. But I was very quiet. I didn't have a sport coat to interview with the U of A Publications Board, which it thought that intimidated me back then. Carson made me believe in myself. I had goals, but I needed the confidence to pursue them. Carson was the first one here to s convey to me, si se puede. It changed the arc of my career and my commitment to make a difference through journalism. Carson and others at the journalism school were on the cutting edge of diversifying media before it became fashionable. The, re the road trips with minority students late at night to interview in Los Angeles at the job fair, which is where I landed my first job. The summer editing program for minority journalists. The diversity summits, summits on campus in which people from around the country came to campus and we viewed like rock stars. Ending the U of, attending the U of A was a seminal event for my career and many others through the decades. The coursework and standards were and continue to be rigorous. Accuracy, fact checking, and context were non-negotiable. That old school foundation remains intact amid emerging technologies and the public fistfights that we sometimes have on social media. Stay old school in your standards, U of A. Techniques of story storytelling will continue to evolve, but don't be blinded by the shiny objects. Credibility and public service remain our lifeblood for our calling. Journalism done right is an obsession, a passion. That is true today as I lead an ambitious newsroom in St. Louis, despite some of the economic henwoods in our industry. Journalism has allowed me to go places and talk with people that I never would have envisioned as a student living in the dorm at Kaibag Huachuca. I was able to travel as a journalist to Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, Germany, where I was able to meet with a handful of people who were varying from US presidents to Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, and many other newsmakers. It's a long way from the desert. I was able to serve as president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and became the second Hispanic editor of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. All these things were achievable because of what I got here at the U of A. Among my role models early in my career was a group of Latino journalists in the California Chicano News Media Association. The world of possibilities for Latino journalists exploded in 1984 when a team of Latinos at the Los Angeles Times won the 1940, 1994 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for ex an extensive series on the growing population in Southern California. One of them is here today and an honoree, Frank Sotomayor. But as a young student, I saw Frank and Frank Delomo and Julio Moran and George Ramos and Jose Galvez and others who work on this project as pioneers for us. Si se puede, Frank. I had the good fortune to work with them through the NHJ and ASNE. I had the chance with, to meet with many other great people. I'd also like to thank Bob Mong, who the retired editor of the Dallas Morning News. He would have scoffed when an impetuous young reporter told him that he wanted to be an editor someday when he hired me to cover the general assignment speed on the Metro desk. But like Don Carson, he saw potential and gave me a chance. When I was executive editor of the Dallas Morning News, I balked when I was asked to leave my coveted job, the one my goal I had in my resume, to start a Spanish language paper called Al Dia. I was tasked with hiring 60 bilingual journalists, salespeople, marketers, circulators, basically starting a newspaper from scratch in Dallas, Texas. What I learned about the newspaper bub publishing business and intimately serving the Latino community proved to be invaluable. Leaving my comfort zone was very shaky at times, but grow I did. <laughs> Everyone needs a mentor and our external voice, voice to help propel you in your self-confidence, your willingness to take a chance. Even the scary ones, like buying your first sports coat. <laughs> Students today, we never achieve anything alone. Good journalism is not about you, but the coverage and the impact it serves, on our serves for our community. Be ambitious, clearly state your ambitions. Find people who believe in you and you will, who bolster you, especially in tough times, when you think your dreams are fading. Daily journalism is not for the faint of heart. The long hours, the weekends, the holidays, the vibrating phone in the middle of the night, and those cranky readers. <laughs> I also must thank the people close to me who've been there from the beginning. My mom and stepdad were not able to make the trip from Tempe, but my sister Elena is here. 
my friend Greg Lafontaine from high school, and of course my wife, who endures the never-ending saga of being married to a compulsive newspaper editor, Lourdes. <laughs> media opportunities some 37 years after I graduated from U of A are more plentiful at organizations and media platforms and languages and diversified markets. Students, I tell you, si se puede. You find your mentors and support each other. The U of A Journalism School continues to be a great inc incubator of quality journalism. I have been fortunate to reap the benefits, and I hope in this quest I've also given back to our industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilbert. At this time, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a very special guest uh, who just happened to stop by. Uh, University of Arizona President Robbins is here with us. He's in the back. And uh, <laughs> President Robbins, we would just like to thank you for your support of journalism. He recently stopped by the, the, the school and met with students, which is something that uh, not a lot of presidents have done. Uh, in fact, uh, in my experience, university presidents have usually run from uh, the, the student journalists. But welcome, uh, Dr. Robbins, and thank you again for being here. Thank you. Honestly, that was a bold move. That was great. All right. Our second inductee today is the late Don W. Carson. Professor Carson, who passed away February 1st at 85 years old, was a 1954 graduate and a reporter for the Arizona Daily Star and Associated Press. He returned to U of A in 1966 to inspire students with his passion for accuracy and diversity for the next 30 years. He was also the department head from 1978 to 1985, and he insisted that all students include middle initials in their stories. <laughs> he started two summer workshops for minority journalists, including one for high school students that is now named after him. Speaking on his behalf is Mike Carson, one of Don's three children, along with Susan and Teresa. Mike. Thank you. Um, before I start, I would like to read a short statement from Jim Johnson, if I could. Jim says, I apologize for missing the induction of this great group of journalists into the Hall of Fame. I am on a speaking engagement in Kansas City. Congratulations to you all. I particularly want to acknowledge Don Carson's induction. He was more than a friend. He also was my mentor, as he was to countless others. Well done, Don. Again, my apologies. My name is Michael F. Carson. <laughs> my sister is here with me, Teresa M. Fortney. Susan C. Cormier, and we are honored that you are honoring, honoring our dad, Donald W. Carson. He is our dad, and we have the privilege to be his children, his family. So on behalf of his family, thank you. We are so proud of him. Our mom, Helen, his wife of 61 years, was so proud of him too. But he has another family. So many people had the privilege to be his students, fellow professors, associates, and friends. If he were here, what would he say? Who would he thank? I think the first thing what he would say was, why are you honoring me? There are so many other people that are more deserving. But he would, he would give thanks. He would thank his family, his wife, his children, his parents. He would thank his fellow professors and associates. And he would thank his students, both when they were students and long after they had graduated. Dad was always genuinely interested in people, even till his last days. He was always encouraging. He was always a truly pleasant person. He was always honest, humble, and kind to everyone. Don Carson embraced the principles of the journalism department, principles which made the department a national presence. His door was always open. He was always available. He demanded excellence, integrity, and fairness. He set an, exa an example for others with his own life. His work went far beyond the classroom. He worked to advance the opportunities for minority journalists. He worked to build bridges of understanding between American and Latin American journalists. He was so proud of his students and he cherished his partnership with fellow professors. He stayed in touch with so many long after students graduation and long after his retirement. 
He was honored by the Arizona Newspapers Association with their Hall of Fame some years ago. And when, in speaking in, in that ceremony, he uh, had been challenged of why he had stayed a professor for such a long time. And he said that individuals who do something well and who enjoy doing it should continue doing it. He said that journalism teaching is much more than knowledge, experience, and availability. Some of the elements he found most important were emphasizing the critical thinking process. Ask why, be curious. Exercising patience and treating each student as an individual. Maintaining standards. Get students to stretch, not relax. And dare I mention again the legendary Otto E policy <laughs> on getting the name right. Broadening the horizon. He wanted to expose students to the real world. And he noted that the journalism in academics is one of the few areas which does that. He also felt that cheerleading and encouraging were so important. He said the outside the classroom relationship is paramount. I want to end with a list of quotes because like I said earlier, this is also his family. And since he is no longer with us, a lot of people have said some wonderful things. And um, I want to read some of those. I will say, too, that I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, to go to the U of A Journalism website, find the announcement about uh, uh, Don Carson, and you can see some additional quotes. But I'm going to uh, reinforce some things that Gilbert just said, and I imagine some other people may say today. These are the quotes. Professor Carson is the reason I'm working as a journalist today. He was always pushing us to do more than we thought we could do. Things I'm convinced affected the trajectory of my life. He was a man of high standards, accuracy, empathy, and compassion. Don Carson put the fear of God into us about accuracy. You omitted a middle initial at your peril. <laughs> His insistence on getting it right informed my newspaper career for nearly 40 years. Don was intelligent, talented, funny, kind, a great teacher, and a mentor to many young people. He was our journalism professor, but we called him Papa Don because he treated us as his own children with respect, caring, and practical advice and guidance. Don believed in newsroom diversity and then put his actions where his mouth was. He did something about it. This next one was a personal one directly to him earlier. You have given so much to people like me who often don't know where they are headed. There are so many minority journalists out there thanks to you. I will always think of you with tears in my eyes about how much you cared and how generous you were with your time. His influence was not limited to journalism. His dignity, steadfastness, concern for others, and his gentleman's grace were also lessons I tried to learn too from this modest teacher. From the time I walked on campus until when I left, he believed in me and helped me overcome my doubts and weaknesses. His spirit will live on in all of us who became journalists. And finally, how many of us will always remember him so very fondly and with undying gratitude and admiration for how much he touched and changed our lives? Thank you very much. Next, we'd like to honor Nancy Cleland. Nancy, if you want to come on up. Uh, Nancy is a 1977 graduate who won the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting as the Los Angeles Times lead writer on the Walmart effect, which detailed how Walmart's drive for lower retail prices affected international labor practices. She also covered immigration and staff bureaus in Mexico for the San Diego Union Tribune. She's now deputy editor of communications at OSHA in the Department of Labor. Nancy Cleland. Thank you very much. Um, that's a hard one to follow. Um, but I am honored and humbled to be here. Thank you so much for um, for uh, including me in this really prestigious group of people. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity it's given me to reflect on the career I had and to think about how lucky I was to, um, to live a journalist's life at a time when, when um, 
it was kind of the golden age for, for newspapers. And, um, and I was able to take full advantage of that. I'm also grateful uh, for the excuse to have a little family reunion uh, in Tucson. My, I have four sisters who live across the country and they have all come here. <laughs> They've all come here to be with uh, me and help me celebrate. And my daughter, who's the same age I was when I was going to school here, is also here. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's interesting to think about the timing and I'm very curious to see where her talents will take her. But it's also very bittersweet for me, and I have a feeling this is going to be a theme today. Uh, it's bittersweet because Don Carson is not here with us. And um, I, I've said many times that I would not be a journalist if it wasn't for Don Carson. And I'm hearing this story over and over again. Um, what an incredible man he was, and, and what an influence he had on so many people. Um, when I arrived in uh, Tucson at the university, I was kind of shy and insecure, and I, I knew I wanted to write. I really loved writing. But after a couple of classes in journalism, I, I started thinking, I'm not cut out for this. I'm, I can't just go up and talk to people that I don't know and then write something about them. What if they don't like it? Um, but uh, I thought many times about changing my major to something like wildlife biology, where I wouldn't have to deal with people at all. But um, <laughs> But Don Carson, he encouraged me, he stayed in touch with me, he, he convinced me that I did have what it takes. And so with that kind of backing, I, I found the, uh, the confidence I needed to push through and, and become a journalist. And it wasn't just him, obviously, he's the one that stands out in my mind, but, um, but so many of my professors and advisors here at the university um, made a big difference in my life. I think of Phil Mangelsdorf, uh, Jackie Sharkey, uh, George Ridge, or Betsy Sharkey, I'm sorry, George Ridge, and many more. They inspired me, they challenged me, they supported me, they scared me sometimes, but they prepared me for, um, for life in the real world. And uh, with that background, I was able to, to really enter the world of professional journalism with confidence and the skills that I needed to just hit the ground running. And it allowed me to keep pushing for more. So I was able to create a new section on adventure travel and spent three years going around the world, skiing, parachuting, scuba diving. I mean, that's a pretty awesome job, right? But I thought, well, I can do more than that. So um, it, it allowed me to um, convince my editors that I could cover the US-Mexico border. And um, talking to migrants as they were coming across this perilous journey, um, it, it really taught me a lot about human nature. And, um, and then I had the privilege of putting those stories into the newspaper and trying to help people understand what was really happening here. Um, it gave me the confidence to create a bureau in Mexico City and spend three years covering that crazy country. And, um, and then to propose a big story on the effects of Walmart in the international labor uh, setting, which was turned down by two editors before I finally found one that said yes. So I could go on and on. I mean, that's the great thing about being a journalist is you have lots of stories to tell, right? Um, but also, I'm very proud of some of the work I did. I, uh, my stories freed three men from a Mexican prison. They were innocent and unjustly uh, detained. My um, Stories on uh, janitors at supermarkets in, South in, in Southern California um, led to those stories to change their labor practices and bring people on staff instead of um, exploiting them through these labor contracts. Um, I think that my continuing stories on immigrants in Southern California helped to improve an understanding and, and uh, communication. All of these accomplishments I attribute to this school. Um, <clears throat> so I want to close by saying that this kind of education that is delivered here at the U of A is needed more than ever now. Um, shrinking newsrooms, disappearing copy editors, the kids that are going out and being journalists today are under more pressure than they've ever been, asked to do more than they've ever done. They need to be ready to go as soon as they leave, right? Uh, and this is a school to prepare them. So University of Arizona Journalism School, just keep doing what you're doing. 
I'm going to be watching, I'm going to be cheering you on, and do everything I can to help. Thank you very much. be playing this game with the mics all day, aren't we? Amazon up here. Okay. Our next inductee is Richard Gilman. Where are you at, Richard? Hey, there he is. All right. He is a 1972 graduate who rose from the Arizona Daily Star reporter and editor to New York Times co-executive to Boston Globe publisher. During his tenure at the Globe, the paper won three Pulitzer Prizes, including the 2003 Award for Public Service for its series on sexual abuse by Catholic priests. And that series led to an Oscar-winning film that you may have heard of, Spotlight. Richard. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful event. Um, first off, for organizing this by alphabet um, and not by age. <laughs> you would have heard from me already. It's, um, it's frightening to imagine what a dark hole this country would be in right now were it not for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other purposeful and resolute news providers. In the best tradition of the true news media, they dig deeper, they report what they find without fear um, or favor. So where do young people learn these ideals? Well, it starts with journalism schools like this one. Speaking for myself, and this echoes what you've already heard, I am forever indebted to the likes of Don Carson, George Ridge, Steve Emmering, they didn't teach, or just teach, how to write a news story. They taught the journalistic principles and core values that provided me with my North Star for my entire career. I appreciate this honor very much. I owe it entirely to the many lessons I learned from these stalwart newsman educators right here at the University of Arizona. I thank each of them. I thank the current faculty and staff. I thank all of you for this honor. Next, we'd like to honor Florence Graves. Florence, if you want to come on up. Florence is a 1976 master's graduate and the founding director of the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism at Brandeis University near Boston. She got her start as an investigative reporter on the school's first El Independiente. She went on to be the founder and editor of Common Cause magazine, where she won the Investigative Reporters and Editors Award for showing flaws in the government approval process for NutraSuite. And her Washington Post exposés of sexual misconduct allegations against Senator Bob Packwood led to his resignation. Florence Graves. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and pleased to be in this distinguished group of uh, people who are being uh, part of this an inaugural class of, of inductees. Uh, first, I want to thank 
all of you at the U of A Journalism School. Uh, school, that took a long time, didn't it? <laughs> Seems to me. <laughs> it was a department when I was here and kept thinking it was going to be a school. Thank you, Professor Sharkey, for your role in, in uh, helping make that happen, along with all of the, the wonderful professors who, uh, who are your colleagues. Um, I also want to thank uh, the, the professors here who influenced me greatly, Professor Mangelsdorf, uh, who said, yeah, I think they might admit you to the Graduate School of Journalism, but we'll have to see. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Carson and Professor Ridge. Uh, and of course, the professor who most influenced me, Jacqueline Sharkey. Uh, she insisted before I left uh, Arizona, you should be doing investigative journalism in Washington. And I'm like, me? <laughs> because this was a time when very few women were actually uh, allowed to do high-level reporting, much less investigative reporting, much less get hired at a major news organization or even a minor one to do the kind of reporting that I as a child, even as a child, had decided that that's what I wanted to do. And it was thanks to her mentorship and tu tutoring me and working with me and allowing me to do my first investigative reporting article for the uh, El Independiente, which she conveniently launched while I was there at the school uh, <laughs> and insisted that I, you know, could do this, that particular piece too. And I think the, was the mayor fired, something like that happened after, <laughs> or the head of Lark. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> the power of journalism, right? And I had seen the power of journalism growing up as a child in Texas, Waco, Texas to be exact. And uh, I was profoundly influenced by the civil rights movement uh, going on during uh, the 60s and seeing all of the, uh, so many people suffering and so many people not being able to have their rights. And I also began to see the power of journalism to change that, to make a difference. And as a child in elementary school, I read the biographies of two famous journalists, maybe the only two female journal, famous female journalists at that time, Ellie Bly and Ellie, uh, Nellie Bly and Ida Tarbell. And I was like, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And so I was surrounded by, you know, both having read these books and having seen journalism play out and seeing that journalism could make a difference in people's lives, that journalism could, actually was playing a role in history, in changing history, in changing the way we think, literally changing the way we think about things, changing our minds, changing the, our collective minds about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, about whether sexual misconduct is acceptable in Congress or whether it was not. And that took, you know, until 1990, 91, when Anita Hill testified for people to finally decide maybe that's a problem in the workplace. Because before that, when I did the Packwood story in 1992, you could not have gotten that story in any major newspaper. I can tell you that, and I've never had anyone challenge me on that. In fact, I was on a radio program with the, with the uh, national correspondent for the New York Times who was based in Washington, and I was at uh, the, the Alex Jones, the good Alex Jones, uh, <laughs> the journalist Alex Jones said, uh, ask him, ask this correspondent, he, uh, he said, uh, would the New York Times have done that story? And I already knew the answer because I tried there first. And uh, he said, no. And Alex said, well, why not? And he said, because uh, editors do not like to write about men's sex lives. I was like, uh, he turned to me immediately and he said, Florence, what do you have to say to that? And I said, well, we weren't writing about Senator Packwood's sex life. We were writing about an abuse of power he was abusing his power to abuse the women who worked for him and the women who, that he came in contact with, whether they were at a hotel, a hotel clerk, or a waitress, anything, because they 
you know, it wasn't, it was acceptable. It was allowed, it was acceptable. And so it's taken a long time, hasn't it, till we got to the Me Too movement, for more and more minds to change about that women are actually, should be treated equally throughout society, not just in the workplace. So um, I, I, would, I would like to also thank my parents who had the good sense and the fortu fortuitous, made a fortuitous decision that I was born at a time when I was on the cusp, when I, when I, after I graduated from the University of Texas, on the cusp of the women's movement. And that meant that I would actually be able to get a job in journalism because when I was younger, people were like, well, where do you think you're gonna work as a journalist? Uh, so history kept, you know, kept, uh, evolved and finally I was actually at the right place at the right time. Thank you, Virginia and Albert George. Uh, also, I would like to say, uh, like to thank uh, fate or the creator because how people say to me, how did you end up at the University of Arizona going to graduate school? I'm like, well, uh, my husband had a job that transferred him here and, you know, it was, they, were, they offered a graduate school in journalism and I will say, Lady Fate, Mr. Fate, shined on me because I could not have gone to a place that could have done more for me and set me on the road to the kind of journalism that I've been able to do for the rest of my career. Uh, that is because of the mentorship that I got from professors here and particularly from Professor Sharkey. She was, she, I think she may have been the first woman professor was she? Or, well, second woman professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, journalism department, now School of Journalism. Uh, and she recognized something in me, just as many of you have said about other professors, and she nourished that. And she made clear that I should be, uh, you know, uh, staying on the path of journalism. And so finally, I would like to say that without her, without the mentorship she's gave me, and also through several years, number of years, in which I would call and go, should I do this? Oh, uh, and yes, you can do it. Oh, okay, I'll start a magazine, never having had any experience at all starting a magazine. She said, you can do it. Um, and finally, I would like to thank my uh, husband, uh, Sam Graves, who is here, and my daughter, Grace Graves, who is also here, uh, and say that, in truth, they have taught me more about the world and about life and about ethics and about uh, staying true, speaking truth to power than just about any other uh, people in my family. So thank you. Thank you all. Our next inductee is Savannah Guthrie. The 1993 graduate is a co-anchor on NBC's Today Show and won a recent Matrix Award, which is given to the top women in communications. She's a former NBC White House reporter and Tucson KVOA4 anchor. Shout out to Tucson. Not only is she a lawyer with a Georgetown law degree, but she also just happened to find time to write a children's book called The Princesses Wear Pants, which soared to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Unfortunately, Savannah could not make the trip from New York today, but she was grac gracious enough to send in a short video. Here it is. Hi everybody and thank you so much to the faculty and administrators at the University of Arizona. I couldn't be more honored to join this incredible group of journalists and educators in the inaugural Hall of Fame and I really wish I were there to celebrate with you. I'm especially proud to be in the company today of two of my former professors, Don Carson and Jacqueline Sharkey, who did so much to encourage me more than 25 years ago. And no, I cannot believe it's been a quarter of a century or more since I first walked the halls of the journalism building. I was a student without a serious major and definitely no serious purpose. It was actually my mom who recommended that I take a few journalism classes. 
I'll never forget what she said. At least in journalism, they'll teach you a skill. I guess she feared me pursuing a degree in the classics or basket weaving or even worse, philosophy. Well, it's been a long time, but I can still see Professor Sharkey's handwriting on the first feature stories I turned in, banged out on a typewriter, maybe it was a Radio Shack computer. I remember and treasure most of all her faith in me. She told me I could write and it made me want to keep going. I remember what a stickler and how old school Professor Carson was and why it meant so much to me to get his very rare praise. I remember my many trips to Tombstone, and wow, it really has been 25 years if I remember those trips fondly. You'd go down there for a couple of days, you're expected to come back with four stories no matter what. Not an easy task in a town with two streets and mostly tourists. I did most of my extensive reporting from the Big Nose Kate Saloon. Anyway, I am so proud of my education at the journalism school, what I learned there, not just the basics of how to report and write, but also how to think critically, to never forget who it is that we serve, and to be fiercely committed to fairness. Those are values I try to carry with me every single day. I've been lucky in my career to cover law and politics at the highest level, and what I learned at the journalism school has never been more relevant. Thank you again for this great honor, and congratulations to my fellow inductees. Accepting Savannah's award is Nancy Guthrie, her mom, who is a former member of the school's Journalism Advisory Council. Next, we honor Hugh and Jan Harrelson. Hugh and Jan impacted students and faculty throughout, through their leadership and their philanthropy. Hugh was a 1952 graduate and became co-chair of the campaign to keep the journalism department open when it was targeted for closure in 1994. After the former Arizona Republic editor and Arizona Highways publisher died in 1998 at age 67, Jan raised money for a computer lab, started an endowment to support it, and funded a teaching award. Jan, a teacher and a community leader, chaired the school's journalism advisory council and, and died in 2015 at age 78. Accepting on their behalf are their sons, Scott and Matt Harrelson, who are here with many other family members as well, and we thank them. Scott, Matt. So, uh, John, there's two, so I think I get 10 minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> I won't need 10. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of my brother Matt, and uh, we're, we're both very happy to be here for our, for our parents for this incredible acknowledgement. We want to thank our family who uh, have come from Colorado and California and parts uh, uh, nearby to, to join us and, and celebrate this. Uh, my nieces have taken time away from their studies to be here, although there might be an instructor or two here who think that's not too much of a stretch for Sarah, soon to be graduate of the Journalist School of Journalism. My folks, of course, would be humbled by this honor, but really tickled that their involvement in the U of A School of Journalism would be an excuse for another family reunion. And we look forward to it. The list of inductees for this inaugural Hall of Fame class is luminous, and each and every one of these individuals has had a tremendous impact on the profession and made a difference for this school and contributed mightily to its mission. Our parents, like Don and Luda Solweedel, had the advantage of operating as a team. It's fitting that they met here on campus while our mother was a journalism student. Dad was already working for the Arizona Republic and apparently recognized our mother's exceptional writing skills and perhaps a few other attributes as well. <laughs> they married and pursued their own individual paths to success. Dad with the Republic, Channel 12 News, and then here at the U of A. And of course, finally, as publisher of Arizona Highways. Mom taught kindergarten in South Phoenix. She opened a quilting business in Tucson. And she later became a champion for several social service agencies in the Phoenix area. But if you ever had the opportunity to read her letters or anything else she might have written, 
you know, you would know, that her, her true gift was with words. Together, they accomplished much. Both were passionate about the profession and the importance of skilled journalists. Both recognized the value this department added, now school, to the U of A, and shared the vision of ensuring it not only survived, but would continue to thrive for decades to come, and it has. Individually, they were engines of change. I marvel now, Matt and I talked about this, at how much time they committed and how much they were able to accomplish for this school despite the demands of everything else in their lives. Uh, Matt was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> we also understand how very proud they would be right now to see their legacy continue when Sarah graduates this spring. Nancy, yes? Are we good on that? I think we're good on that. <laughs> Hugh Harrelson was the big picture guy. He understood the complexities and politics of the university, and he was the great navigator, steering those who didn't fully appreciate or understand the importance of the department, on a, steering them on a correct course through careful and thoughtful conversations and action. Jan shared his intellectual prowess. She was the person that, but, but for those who remember her, she was the person who got stuff done. <laughs> her appetite for success and improvement motivated others to take action and get stuff done too. Matt and I are both very proud of our parents and very honored that you would recognize them and have included them with these other amazing leaders and journalists. We look forward to watching the school continue to grow and produce skilled writers, reporters, and leaders in this important profession. Thank you. I'm just going to say, I'm going to be very quick because I always hate following my brother who's a professional at this, and I always fall behind it for some reason, which is not a good position to be in. But uh, I want to congratulate all the uh, amazing honorees as well. I want to thank the advisory council and the faculty for this incredible award to our parents who I wish so much could be here today uh, to enjoy this and see so many friends out in the, uh, out in the audience. And uh, uh, I want to thank the faculty, too, for potentially passing my daughter uh, <laughs> on her degree. But how, how unique it is to be uh, uh, this generational thing with the Harrelsons. She's a third generation and will be uh, um, a graduate from the School of Journalism, which would have made my parents so proud. So thank you very much. All right, next up is Jane K. Jane? A 1961 graduate, Jane was named the nation's top environmental reporter in 2008. Her 1985 Arizona Daily Star series on TCE pollution in groundwater from Hughes Aircraft, which is now Raytheon, led to a federal cleanup. She went on to do award-winning work for The Examiner and Chronicle in San Francisco, National Geographic, and others reporting on shrinking ice in the Arctic and forest loss in the Amazon. She is also, just happens to be, the big sister of journalist and U of A professor, Mort Rosenblum. Well, first of all, I want to say to Dawn that I didn't even know I had a middle initial. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in newsrooms. My first newsroom was the old Arizona Daily Star, building on stone, pale pink, stucco, with the Palo Verdes out front. I don't know if any of you remember it. Okay. <laughs> well, remember how, well, when I started there, well, I turned 21 in that newsroom. And I was fresh out of the University of Arizona journalism department slash school. And I, I could hear Professor Sherman Miller's voice saying inspirationally, 
why did you get married and stay in Tucson? <laughs> and, but the newsroom, the, we know, the clack of the typewriters, the rubber cement gluing all the newsprint pages together, rolling it all up, sending it in the pneumatic tubes, um, the linotype machines, that crazy clanking, the hot lead, and the way the whole building rumbled when the presses ran. The best part of it all really has always been just the really magnificent part was this frenzied gathering of these smart, sensible, fun, skeptical people trying to get at the truth on deadline. <laughs> and, you know, we always had, uh, as today, um, slick lies, spin from people for real, from, with really fanatical agendas, and um, reporters and editors would f fight it and still do today. It's, it's just part of the job. And we, lo we love our newsrooms. We still love our newsrooms. There are few fewer today than there have been. And they are the food of the truth on, on the web. That's where, that's where the news comes from. And our, our commitment to journalism lives beyond the physical newsrooms. We're creating virtual newsrooms and where editors and reporters communicate not across desks, but across the country and across the world. And they need trained professionals more than ever because there is not that mass in newsroom training ground that so many people ha have always had. And that's the job that the University of Arizona School of Journalism has always done and will continue to do. There, there is no substitute for intellectual development in the arts and the sciences and, and training by, by trusted teachers. We all learn from our betters, from Doug Martin, from Sherman Miller, from Don Carson, from Jacqueline Sharkey. And we knew and, and we know that one must learn law and ethics, ethics and the craft to carry out the public, public interest responsibility in, in today's world of journalism, professional is a word of pride. And I thank my dear family and friends who have put up with my 60 year habit of putting the story first. And they have welcomed my stories as depressing as my stories always are. <laughs> And they never, never once complained, never once complained. My mother used to cut out all of my brothers and my stories. And those are a lot of stories. And we're still pumping them out today. And I offer my greatest appreciation to my sons, Henry and Alec. Henry, where are you? Oh, <laughs> Alec. Um, the most patient of all, and who by virtue of their parents were hatched out in newsrooms and grew up in newsrooms. And thank you to the journalism school faculty for this marvelous honor. Journalism has been the main stem of my life. I feel this honor today brings my, my Tucson roots and trunk together with my San Francisco branches and flowers, and I thank you.
for that, Jane. All right, we are at the halfway point now, so I would now like to invite the school director, David Coulier, up to say a few words about the school and show a short video. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks everyone who's here. Uh, to me, this has been like a fine wine tasting so far. I mean, we've had a taste of amazing people. Some have aged brilliantly, and um, and and I'm the saltine cracker. So um, so I'm here to cleanse your palate, and then we move on to uh, all amazing people as well. And thanks to John and Sarah for emceeing. You're doing an amazing job. Just great job. Wow. Um, and, and thanks for all of you for showing up on a great Saturday. I, I can tell you that our school is strong. I mean, we've built on an amazing past. In two weeks from now, I'll be in Chicago where our accrediting body for journalism education in the nation is going to re-accredit us for um, uh, flying colors, all standards passed. And by the way, only about 10% of journalism programs can achieve that in this country. So what we have is special and good. And it's a testament of where it all started, 1951. The people who got it going, to those who built it up through the decades, to those who fought back against shutting it down in 1994, and we succeeded, and to those of all of you today who are making it great and, um, and really what we all stand for. Because believe me, our mission is absolutely clear. We are here to serve society by advancing the practice of journalism through research and through training the best reporters in the world we can who inform the public and hold those in power accountable. That's what we're all about. Nothing else. That's what we do. And, and it's so critical, as we know today, even more than ever. So I'd like to thank people who have made all this happen. First, big thanks to Mike Chesnick, who coordinated everything right here. Mike, our program coordinator. A lot of work. <laughs> A lot of stressful work. And not to mention all the other staff members who have helped, Andres Dominguez, Debbie Cross, Paloma Boykin, Renee Schaefer-Horton, uh, Danny Ramirez did the program, video guru Rogelio Garcia with help from student Michael Romero, and Nick Smallwood, the student running around with the camera. Thank you all for doing all this. This is important. <laughs> and of course, you know, what a school is about, it's people. It's people. Uh, and it's like Soylent Green, kind of. It's people. <laughs> and it c we couldn't do it without the faculty. I mean, the faculty are what's all We've heard so many mentions of Don Carson and Jacqueline Sharkey and other faculty who inspired people. The faculty today, please stand up and thank you for all you do. You are important. Yes. You inspire. And of course, we couldn't do this without money, right? And so that means support from people who care about good journalism. Support from like Bobby Joe Buell over here who funded a lot of this event and helped put it on. Bobby Joe, you are amazing. Great uh, alum, advisory council member, uh, as well as everyone else who donated in honor of inductees or bought multiple tickets for students. And, and uh, let alone the Harrelsons. I mean, the Harrelsons have provided thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the school's operations endowment. And without that, we would be in dire straits. So it makes a difference. And I can't wait to shake Sarah's hand <laughs> wherever she went. She had to run to the airport? All right, well, uh, I'll see her May 10th on the stage at McHale where she gets a diploma, stamp of approval, School of Journalism U of A. So good job. And the other students here, uh, stand up students. You are amazing. You are, yes. Good job. Thank you. 
each and every one of you will be coming up here someday to get your own plaque. So remember this moment, right? You're going to do wonderful, amazing things. Um, and then finally, uh, I'd just like to say that um, um, uh, if you want to support the cause, on the back of your program are a list of, it, of, of good causes in the names of many inductees here today. Jacqueline Sharkey, Rich Gilman, Jan, Hugh and Jan Harrelson, Don Carson, um, Frank Soto, uh, Sotomayor, Donald Lula. So we have funds uh, that, that matter and they make a difference. And if you care, support the cause. Be, join us in this effort. Uh, not to mention, put it in your will. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, it counts. Um, I, I, uh, and it's important. And, and you, you know, we, we make fun of politicians a lot and those in power. I mean, that's our jobs, right? To hold them accountable. And we've had some doozies of presidents here at the university uh, and a cycle of just a bunch of them that have been mind-boggling. But I, I do have to say, our current president, and this isn't just kissing up, because he's sitting right here. <laughs> but I do believe, and Jacqueline, correct me if I'm wrong, has a sitting university president ever come to the school or department, talked with students, talked with faculty, engaged? Has that happened before? No. <laughs> Once? Was that when uh, Pacheco to shut us down? He came with a... Huh? It, it's rare and unusual. We have a president here. Come on up here, President Robbins. Come on up. He ins this, and he's kind of an odd bird because he insists that you call him Bobby. And, and so I have to say, Bobby, thanks uh, for taking an interest in journalism. And um, everybody who's talked to you says that you, you're the most likable, approachable president we've ever had. So uh, w would you like to say a few words, please? So as you can tell, I didn't dress for the occasion, so I apologize. I'm coming from football practice and then off to another event. Uh, so as I keep reminding people, uh, the longer you, you know me, the less you'll like me. So it's like the, it's the country western song, how can I love you when you won't leave me? So I, I know I start here and, and, the, and the journalist will find ways to, as the editor of the Houston Chronicle told me, his job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So I, I know, I know uh, uh, what you're up to. So, but I, I can't imagine getting a bigger treat uh, than to sit here and listen to the uh, induction of the Hall of Famers. Uh, congratulations to all of you. Um, and, and David, I, I called him, I'd never met him. Uh, maybe we had met briefly, because uh, there were so many people I met at the beginning. But I called him after the review. You know, you get reviews of schools and colleges, and it's usually a, a group of, um, of deans from across the country and they came to me to give me the report about the School of Journalism. And I can uh, you trust but verify that uh, <laughs> indeed the school had absolutely uh, no findings on the report that, and it was all very positive. And they said this is the, you know, the first time they'd seen this. And uh, they, they told me, uh, I should have known this because I did a lot of reading about uh, the university before uh, I accepted uh, uh, this position. I obviously didn't comprehend the reading very well, but uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see a lot of the stuff coming, like the basketball uh, investigation. <laughs> but I, I didn't read about that anywhere. But the, um, <laughs> yeah, the fine print. Uh, it was amazing to me that they told me, just matter of factly, uh, you know, you've got one of the best journalism uh, uh, schools of journalism in the country, it's, it's known in the business as New York Times West. So I called him up and said, I, I just had one of the most incredible meetings I've ever had and I want to come and, and visit with you and visit the school and find out who all of these stars are and now I get to see uh, not only the faculty and the incredible students that we have, but why it's so great. It's because of the foundation that, uh, that I'm hearing about and so many of the stars 
who've done so well over the years. So uh, thank you for allowing me to come and uh, uh, attend this. I can't wait for the, for the uh, second act uh, after I stop talking. I'm about to stop talking, I promise you. But um, the University of Arizona is truly an incredible institution. Uh, I knew it before I got here. I just didn't know how great it was. And it's made by the faculty and the staff that it, it seems that once you get to Tucson, you just never leave because the university draws you in. And, um, you know, I, I spent uh, the last few days with the Board of Regents, but on the side, uh, going on tours and trying to recruit students and telling the incredible stories uh, that we have here. And your whole lives are telling stories, and I love reading them. Uh, as many of the speakers have said uh, that have been up already, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, the, the, w w journalism, uh, the, the business you know, the, uh, of watching uh, it reminds me of being a kid and uh, back in the uh, civil rights days growing up as a little kid in Mississippi and uh, reading the stories and being mesmerized by how this could be going on in uh, where I lived to Vietnam, to Watergate, and to, to today when you just see every night there's a blockbuster from the New York Times or the Washington Post. So it's the fine line that keeps us between uh, the craziness that's going on and anarchy. Uh, so please students, go out. Uh, be excited about what you're learning here. Uh, take your education. And, and one day you will uh, get one of these awards, I'm confident of it. And, and so f in, in closing, I, I told the, the faculty when I was there, I can't imagine that there haven't been presidents. This would be the first place that every president should go. And, and I think that you're the real stars. I mean, we've got so many stars, uh, incredible faculty members, Nobel laureates, but you're all superstars. And, Thank you for choosing the University of Arizona and staying here and continuing to do the great work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Bobby. We really appreciate it. Well, back to the wine, shall we? Uh, and now we're going to see... Hi, my name is Stephanie video. Soto. I work at KLD as a digital producer for the Noticias 13 app. One day, I hope to become a news anchor. It all started here at the University of Arizona School of Journalism. My first day was intimidating. I had no idea how I would balance my degree while working at the same time. In my first class, I learned the basics of law, ethics, reporting, and the role of the press in a democratic society. I was hooked. And with the support of my friends and professors, I knew what I wanted. To be a reporter, tell stories, and uncover the truth. Information is power. And yet, we need that information to hold people accountable. So that's what journalists are for. A lot of people in Tucson, like you're so close to the border, yet so many people have never been there. It'd be okay to go down there and you can cross the border. I have taken classes where I visited local radio stations and got involved with people and their stories along the border in the south and in the north too. Muy pero muy buenos días, ¿qué tal mis amigos? ¿Cómo están? Me da mucho gusto saludarles. ¿Y cómo está la situación del crimen acá? Estas fronteras siempre hay, siempre hay actividad, no siempre hay cuestión de migración, cuestión de drogas. forget the days in my writing class. We all got together in a newsroom atmosphere and had to research, write, and report for Tombstone Apithas, El Independiente, and Arizona Sonoran News. Nice piece, well written, and it's a good read. It's a lovely story. Journalism students can learn photography in different countries around the world. media professionals come speak to the group and inspire young journalists. I'm Madison Brodsky. 
and I'm Brandon Mejia. We bring you all the stories from around Southern Arizona. Welcome to Arizona Cat's Eye, a news broadcast produced by the University of Arizona School of Journalism. You're learning a lot and you're learning from the best. They have worked in front and behind the cameras, reported worldwide, and even won the most prestigious journalism award, the Pulitzer Prize. Journalism will get you an internship at the Arizona Daily Star, NPR, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, TMZ, Science News, and ESPN. I discovered my passion here in the School of Journalism, and my story is just one of many. That video makes me want to go back to school, <laughs> but not to pay tuition. Uh, by the way, the narrator, the narrator in that video is Stephanie Soto. She graduated last spring and is now working as a television reporter for Telemundo. Let's get back to our speeches. Uh, our next honoree is the late Douglas Martin. He founded the school in 1951 uh, after journalism had been part of the Department of English. He began the school's Zinger Award for Press Freedom in 1954. And as a journalist, he helped the Detroit Free Press win two Pulitzer Prizes. When he retired from U of A in 1956, he wrote several books, including The Lamp in the Desert, about the university's first 70 years. He died in 1963 at age 78. To speak on his half is Edie Oslander, a 1961 graduate and former professor and Arizona Board of Regent, and one of my mentors. So, Edie, welcome. <laughs> Like Doug Martin, I'm not very tall. <laughs> but not like Doug, Doug Martin, I can tell you more about him. Uh, and Thank you for giving me a chance to. At first, um, uh, his shy demeanor didn't reflect his enthusiasm for life and his extraordinary, his extraordinary abilities. <laughs> Better? Okay. Yes, no, okay. But a cl closer look told the story. We really lucked out when he came our way. We're greatly fortunate. After a sterling newsroom career, he moved to Tucson and made good use of the knowledge of, to develop and endow the excellent department of journalism. Um, that quality of ex excellence that continues, the School of Journalism Courage and Integrity Award, which is named for Doug, has been given to a student each year since 1964. Fortunately, one can still become acquainted with Doug by reading his books. In all three, he made excellent use of sources and extensive research to record history. The first, Yuma Crossing, weaves together accounts about the safest place to ford the Colorado River between what are now Arizona and California, and that was for 400 years. It was the route of the Norman, Mormon Battalion, for example. Tombstone's Epitaph also is a collection of stories. This one about the town too tough to die, which we know so much about, but he tells more. To facilitate his research, Doug took a summer job as editor of the Epitaph, which gave him proximity to old copies of the newspaper. I think you did that, Joe Cole. Didn't you go down there for a summer, run the paper, and get to know what Tombstone was all about? The news stories in the sto in, from the ep Epitaph paint a picture of the unique and multifaceted community. For an example, an article about the antics of sporty men and sporty women could also appear next to a church social account. Then there is the lamp in the desert about the establishment of the University of Arizona by the, the thieving 30th, 13th legislature and its construction on land provided by two gamblers and a saloon keeper. The, legislation ha the legislature had three institutions to gift at the time. They gave the uh, capital to Prescott and they gave Phoenix the insane asylum. <laughs> the, least of, uh, the least of the gifts was the university which Tucson got, not too happily, but aren't we glad now? Doug Martin relished reporting the news, journalism education and recording Southwestern history. His legacy continues to benefit us all. Thank you. Are we 
it's in a paycheck. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> Next, we would like to recognize the late Sherman R. Miller III. How many of you, be honest, how many of you got an auto E during your time here? Yeah, there are the honest people. Professor Knight, what? Oh my gosh. Well, we have Professor Sherm Miller to thank for starting that rule, which is still very much enforced here at the school. After a distinguished professional career, including the New York Times, New York Times of the West, he became department head in 1961 and led the school to its first accreditation in 1964. He also advised the Arizona Daily Wildcat and was named a super prof by Esquire magazine. I love that. He died in 1968 at 57 years old. His daughter, Melissa Murphy, and family members are here today. Speaking on his behalf is Nan Durando, a 1966 graduate and supporter of the school. Nan. What do you say about Sherman R. Miller III? His pre-University of Arizona career is impressive, and the impact he had on the University of Arizona's journalism department, now school, is significant and still being felt today. As you heard, he led the way to the department's initial accreditation. He molded the department in sync with his philosophy that one learns best by doing. He recruited and hired great professors, Phil Mangelsdorf and Don Carson, who's also being honored here today, who did great things for the department. His innovative community newspaper class showed students a newspaper universe sort of parallel to, the lo to those of the big city dailies like the New York Times and others where he had worked. In that class, students examined weekly newspapers from small communities around the state like Globe or Miami or Cottonwood, and then made several trips during the course of the semester to, that, to one of those uh, communities to write feature stories, long in-depth feature stories going to, the, to, to such places in a small plane that he somehow managed the, to the university powers, uh, powers to be that made that possible for the class. And at the end of the semester, the class would then go to that community and essentially put out that paper for the week. Um, we'd get there, we got there via uh, official university cars, which he also somehow managed to obtain. I'm not sure that would be possible today in this litigious society. But we would go there that week and put out that weekends of the, uh, that week's issue of the newspaper with the, the future stories we had already written and covering news that was going on that week, like the city council meeting or minor vandalism at a national monument nearby. When I think back about that class, I wonder how he had time to do anything else because it involved so much and was so difficult to put together. And SRM was the one behind the taking of the Wildcat from three to four to five times a week, making the daily Wildcat the fifth largest daily in the state of Arizona, something he would say with pride not because of what he did to make it happen, but because of what his students did to make it happen. Equally important, and perhaps even more important, is the impact and influence he had on his students. It's been more than 50 years since Mr. Miller, as we respectfully referred to him prior to graduation, 
50 years, half a century, since he taught in this journalism department school. But when his former students are together, his name will always come up. And he will be always spoken of in what I refer to as the superlative tense. Many of us came into our first journalism class thinking we were pretty darn good writers. But he let us know immediately that English major writing was not going to cut it in the newsroom. He taught us what it meant to be and how to be a journalist. He taught us how to think, how to inquire, how to write, how to accept brutal criticism. He praised and criticized in the correct proportions. He made students anxious to graduate so you could get a job and get to work. He instilled in us the absolute necessity of and respect for truth and accuracy. He emphasized that a free press had to be a responsible press. We listened to him and we learned. Many will say he changed the course of their lives. Many will say they became journalists because of him. All will say they became good journalists because of him. And of course, there are what we lovingly refer to as shermisms. There are two kinds of people in the world, he would say, newspaper people and everybody else. Then he'd laugh, a big, deep, loud laugh. His insistence that he was a newsman, not a journalist. Get it right, a command, not a request. His disdain for convoluted sentences. Backward runs the sentence until, until reels the mind, he would say with a disapproving sneer. His reference to freelance writers, his pronunciation. You can't call yourself a freelance writer until someone pays you for what you write. His, his bin method for writing long feature stories, a method totally obsolete uh, with today's recorders and word processors. His use of the word zilch as his go-to substitute for a name, as in Joe Zilch rather than Joe Smith or Joe Blow. Blow. Shermisms all, shermisms indeed. With us tonight are his daughters, Melissa Miller Murphy and Abigail Miller Johnson. His third daughter, Christine Miller Loydolt, could not be here. His wife, Liz, whom we all knew, all of his students knew her, died in 1998, and sadly his son, Sherman R. Miller IV, passed away three years ago. About this time, I was going to say something like, I wished Sherman R. Miller were here now, which incidentally would make him about 108 years old. <laughs> But the fact is, he is here. This is the part that's hard for me. He's here in the very significant contributions to the journalism school. He's here in the co his contributions to his profession. He's here in the Sherman R. Miller Award established in 1968 to recognize the success of the outstanding journalism graduate each year. He's here in the Sherman R. Miller Wildcat Newsroom, named in his honor in 2004. He's here in the hearts of his daughters. I'm sorry. And he's here in the life and the work and the professional core of every student he taught and touched. I am honored to accept for him and on, on behalf of his family and to welcome him into the Journalism Hall of Fame. I know he would be very happy and very grateful for this honor. And so I ask again, 
What do you say about Sherman R. Miller III? The answer is very easy. Plenty. And not enough. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Sherm. Thank you, Nan, for connecting us all back to the very important foundations that, uh, upon which all of our careers and what we do here are built. Thank you. Our next inductee is Lynn Olson. 1969 graduate, Lynn is a New York Times best-selling author of seven books on World War II, politics and diplomacy. After graduation, she became a, natural, a national feature writer and Moscow correspondent for the Associated Press and White House reporter for the AP and the Baltimore Sun. Lynn co-wrote two books with her husband, Stan Cloud, including one on Edward R. Murrow. If you have time tomorrow, she'll be talking after a 2 p.m. showing of Good Night and Good Luck about Murrow at the Loft Cinema on Speedway, part of our school's journalism on-screen series. Lynn? Thank you very much. This is a, a really great honor, and uh, like everybody else who's uh, been awarded this honor today, I'm thrilled to be included in the stellar company of the first class of inductees of the U of A Journalism School Hall of Fame, and particularly to my uh, fellow AP alum, uh, and uh, we don't see each other very much, Mort Rosenblum, um, who uh, has always inspired me at the AP and elsewhere. Um, I came to the University of Arizona from a small Catholic high school in Denver. I was here because my father had taken a job as a professor uh, at the U of A, and the reason I was here was basically I got free tuition. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I really was hesitant about coming here, not because I had anything against the University of Arizona, um, but because it was such a huge school compared to what I was used to. My uh, graduating class was, I think, 80 in, in high school, and it was just overwhelming to me initially. I was totally intimidated by the size of this um, university. Um, I joined a sorority. Uh, I got involved in campus activities. I was majoring in government, uh, but I never felt totally at home here. My goal in life at that point was to work in Washington, D.C., hard as that may be to believe now, um, but it was, it was an exciting place uh, back then, and I was really attracted to public service. But at the end of my sophomore year, I started asking myself, okay, what are you going to do if you actually do get there? Um, I had nothing really to offer. Uh, you know, the, uh, graduates in political science and government are, were a dime a dozen. Um, and I was determined I was not going to be a secretary no matter what. Um, so I wasn't really trained. Um, so in, at the end of my sophomore year, I decided at the, on the spur of the moment to take a couple of journalism classes, thinking maybe I could become a journalist in Washington. Uh, unlike some of my uh, colleagues in this uh, in first class, I had absolutely no thought of writing um, before uh, that I took that decision, made that decision. I had no idea of becoming a journalist at all. So at the start of my junior year, I enrolled in the beginning news writing class in the journalism department. At the end of the first week of that class, I knew. I knew I had found a home. I knew that this is one, what I wanted to do. Thanks to the incomparable Steve Emmerine, who was my first professor and a uh, professor, I mean a teacher in se several other classes that I took, a dear, dear man, and a fabulous teacher, and of course, the inimitable Don Carson, who I owe so much. I am a broken record like everybody else here. And Nan tearing up, oh, uh, talking about Sherman Miller, I, if I don't watch it, I will tear up about Don Carson. He was absolutely the best. 
but there were others, George Ridge, Phil Mangelsdorf. Uh, and as a result of them, again, I'm a broken record, my life changed overnight. This place became my home and my community for the next two years. I loved everything about it. It was so much fun. I mean, I never looked forward to a class in my entire uh, school career, the way I looked forward to classes. Go going every, every day I had a journalism class, I was excited. Uh, and it, it, it stayed that way through, through the rest of the, those two years. Um, Gil talked about um, the inspiration and the help that he got as a Hispanic journalist. I and my female colleagues in, in the class of 69 felt the same way. Um, one of my dearest friends is back there, Pam Ginsbach, who uh, we were both in uh, the class of 69. And back then, as um, I think Florence was talking about, um, it was really difficult for women to get a job in journalism other than on the women's pages. Um, and again, that's not something that I wanted to do. I mean, the idea of covering government, the idea of covering uh, becoming a foreign correspondent, which I eventually did, um, the idea of covering the White House, which I eventually did. There were, there were some women who had done that, but not very many. But again, these professors, and they were all men back then. Jackie had not yet appeared on the scene when I went to school um, here. They were incredibly supportive of us young women. Um, just to give you an idea, Steve Emmerine was instrumental in give, getting me an internship with Mo Udall, the congressman from the second district when I graduated. So I made it to Washington uh, very briefly before I started my journalism career. Don Carson and Phil Mangelsdorf, both uh, AP Associated Press alums, helped me get my first journalism job with the AP. They were my mentors and friends from that day, from the day I graduated. And they inspired me throughout my 10-year journalism career. They inspired me when I taught journalism at uh, American University in Washington. They were always in my mind when I taught, hoping that I could be as good as they were, and I never was. But, and they also, in the last 20 years, I've become an author. I'm a historian. I write books of history. And I'm constantly thinking of what I learned from Don, from Steve, from Phil, from, from the rest when I write. I write about people in history. I mean, I, I'm a historian, but I'm always thinking first about people, talking about how people lived, what people did. Uh, and I always remember what they used to say is you've got to grab them by the first paragraph. Um, I have often been, well, not criticized, but there's a, there's a distinction between popular historians, which I supposedly am, and academic historians. Uh, and popular historians are often denigrated by academics because they tell interesting stories. That's not why we're denigrated. We're, we're denigrated because we, <laughs> no, that's not. We're denigrated because we, we don't follow the strict academic guidelines for writing history. But it often boils down to that. Um, you know, I look at history as being um, created by people. People are history. And so I, I try to tell it in a way that bring people to life, uh, the agents of history, the agents of change. Um, and as I said, I always think back to what I was uh, taught here. There is no way I would be standing here, and there's no way I would have done the things in my career uh, without those men. Everything I've learned, I've learned here first. And for that, I am so very, very grateful. Thank you. All right, now it is time to honor, oh, you're on it. OK, Mort Rosenblum. <laughs> He's ready for his applause. <laughs> Before we get to as many accolades, I have to say that Professor Rosenblum, 
I, I, I never had him when I was a student at the U of AJ school, but I had friends who had you. And the one thing that I always heard about you was that you should be the Dosa Key spokesman because you were indeed the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> so if you're looking for a second career path, there is that. But now to the accolades. After graduating from U of A in 1965, he became an Associated Press Bureau Chief and special correspondent covering 200 countries, from war in Biafra to tango dancing by the Seine in Paris. He's written, do you see what I'm saying? Like most interesting man in the world? He's written a dozen books, including coups and earthquakes, and is the former editor of the International Herald Tribune. Some of you uh, here may have taken his global reporting class where he is still a professor and manages to still fit his head through the door miraculously after being named a local genius by MOCA, the Tucson Museum of Contemporary Art. More? I think I've got all 30 pages here. Uh, I only say that to, to scare Mike, to whom there ought to be a plaque on the table, because you've done such a great job on this. Um, here, it's only one page. Um, the, um, actually, my only real claim to fame is being Janie Kay's little brother. Um, and Elise Gelman Light's little brother. Um, three of us Rosenblums have heard our calling and learned our craft here. And uh, Elise and Jane focused, you know, pretty much on things closer to home. And I kind of got the itch early, and I kind of learned that foreign correspondents get to cruise around the world, usually on somebody else's expense account, and see all sorts of stuff and not have to kill anybody. And <coughs> it's a pretty good job. Um, it was funny because I got so fired up by Sher Miller that I kind of went to the AP and ended up in the Congo a couple, just about 10 minutes after graduation. <laughs> and I kind of exaggerated my ability to speak French. I mean, Jan Janie said, you know, well, you're gonna have to write the guy was killed because you don't know the word for wounded. But anyway, foreign or domestic, uh, at the heart of it all is the line that Nan just scooped me on from Sherm Miller, which is, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world, newspaper people and the other kind. And these days, paper is less important. Um, but the principles haven't changed since Caesar sent those letters from Gaul. And there is some legionnaire in the background scribbling out non-fake news and sneaking it back to Rome. <laughs> um, <coughs> for half a century now, I've learned <coughs> the basic reality that Izzy Stone, I have Stone, lived by all governments lie. Um, some were learning lie more than others, but, um, but the basic thing is, is the government's job is to lie and ours is to catch them at it. And uh, fake news isn't really the problem. I mean, any any interested reader can check that out the way a reporter does. The real problem is junk news. Um, the real problem is things that just aren't thoroughly enough reported by people who know what they're talking about. And really, to do that, you have to be where the news is. Um, and you need training. And of course, that's where this place comes in. I mean, these in a day of what I call karaoke journalism, I mean, anybody can step up to the mic whether you know the words of the tune or not. Um, and this is what this school teaches. It's always taught, and, um, and it's doing it now. Um, you know, our tools and toys evolve by the week. Um, you know, there's so many new ways to deliver the news and to, to, to do it, but what counts is really the bedrock pursuit, no, not the tools and the toys and the means of getting the story out, but the story. Um, the, um, I mean, I call myself these days a, an old croc correspondent and, and not with a K. I, I'm, I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of crocodiles. I mean, just some slimy old reptile kind of cruising around in the swamps and seeing what's getting missed. And, um, you know, the J school here taught me that. Um, and that's why I keep coming back um, to kind of pass on what I've, what I've learned. Um, there are, of course, some people to signal out. Um, Don Carson. While I, while I was still out in the world, uh, I once wrote in a letter that my goal in life was to be Don Carson, because I was out, you know, I really wanted to work for the AP, and he was really doing it in Washington. And 
we kept in touch. And then when, <clears throat> when I was in Paris, I guess by then he asked me to come back and teach when I had some time off, which I did for a while. And then again, when I left the AP, Jacqueline Sharkey um, asked me to come back each year, which of course I was th have th been thrilled to do ever since. And, um, you know, I mean, there's just so many people to, uh, to admire and to thank. Uh, but I just want to say one word for Jeanette, my wife, who uh, every time, I mean, really, I really get cracked up with this. Every time the phone rings in the middle of the night, the answer is always, yeah, get on the plane, go. Really takes, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, this it's what Sherm said about, you know, newspaper people and the other kind. It's true. I mean, you, you really, this is a calling. I mean, this is not something we say very often among ourselves because it sounds corny. And we certainly don't say it to outsiders because it sounds puffed up. Um, and we don't do it because we're missionaries or, you know, for anything else. We expect to get paid. Um, but you don't really go out in places where you can get your ass killed um, for a salary. You know, that's just not, you know, that's not how it works. And so this is, it's a business. It's a calling, it's a profession, it's a way of life, something to take seriously, and this is a place to learn it. Thanks. Our next honoree is Jacqueline Sharkey. Uh, she is the school's first female director. She, under her uh, stewardship, she expanded the curriculum, the faculty, the enrollment, and oversaw the move from the biohazard-laden Franklin Building to the new sleek Marshall Building in 2004. The 1972 graduate and professor founded El Independiente, the school's bilingual publication that serves South Tucson and Southern Arizona. She was also a top journalist. Professor Sharkey reported on Latin American insurgencies, including coverage of the Iran-Contra scandal that led to congressional investigations and was a Washington Post copy editor. Jacqueline. It's a privilege to be here today among the initial inductees into the School of Journalism Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Because since the school was founded, it has been very clear about what its mission is. And that is, we are a democratic institution, a fundamental democratic institution, and our role in a democratic society is to provide people with information they need, accurate, comprehensive information, with perspective, with history, with context, so that the public can make informed decisions at the ballot box about government policy and policymakers. That fundamental role has never changed. The people who have been inducted, whom you've heard from so far, have all worked in service to that mission, and it has never been more important. When I used to talk to students in the first class in the journalism school, a sort of survey class of journalism, what I used to say is that we are now in a war over who controls the information that the public gets. And it is probably the most important war of the 21st century. And our job as journalism educators and our job as journalists is to be able to think critically about information and the role that it plays and how to gather it how to evaluate it, how to organize it, and how to send it to the public in a way that will enable people to participate in their own governance. This fundamental mission is under attack in a way that it has never been in the history of this country. There is no more important role that journalists have today than to continue to act as an institution that protects the other pillars of democracy. It is our job still, and those of you who are students, it will be your job soon. No matter what the medium and technology has presented, challenges as well as tremendous opportunities to get more information in more depth without the constraints 
of, you know, it has to be so many inches, you can only have so many photographs. The internet has opened up the possibilities for journalism and the challenges for journalism in ways that really the profession has never faced. So as you think about journalism, think about it as the institution that is responsible for informing the public about democracy itself. Without a free press, it's almost impossible to have a democratic system of government. And now we see that not only is the institution of the press under attack, but the very idea of truth, the very idea of facts, the very idea that there are different kinds of information and some of it is more valid than other, is under attack from the highest places in our government and governments around the world. So one of the reasons I am so honored to be here is that this school of journalism is on the front lines of the information war. And according to our mission, that is exactly where we are supposed to be. And everyone in this room today has supported that mission in one way or another. For example, Florence Graves, who started out here as a student doing investigative reporting on the local alcoholism reception center for El Independiente, became my mentor when I was working in Central America and she was running Common Cause magazine. And that was at the time, Central America was at the top of the foreign policy agenda the way the Middle East is today. Florence became my editor. She became the person who encouraged me, the person who said, yes, you need three months to go investigate how Honduras is being militarized and what this means for the wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua. Go for it. I'll, he I'll help you. I'll find the support for you. The faculty and staff of the journalism school, many of whom are here today, had a shared vision of how to build the department into a school. It was their experience in the world, their experience dealing with lies and liars in all aspects of politics and economics and sociology and culture that enabled them to bring into the classroom the ability to get both the practical and the theoretical knowledge about law, about ethics, about critical thinking, about information, and the role of the press in a democratic society that enabled us to build a program that has become, in, in Professor Couillier's words, a, a national model of how to form a curriculum around the idea of the press as a democratic institution whose job is to enable people to make informed decisions about their government. And I would say that the other major role that we have is providing information that's fundamental to other academic disciplines. And many of our faculty have joint appointments in history, in government and public policy, because journalism is so interdisciplinary. If you open a history book, that's you know, from your class, if you open a political science book, you will find that many of the sources of information used by scholars are the news media. And so one of the roles that we have is to make sure, for example, that history itself is not a lie. That the discussions in the academy, in the public, about government policy on all levels is not a lie. And the faculty and staff of the journalism school over the last 50 years have worked incredibly hard to make sure that that happens. And there have been other people who've joined the fight. The Harrelson family, where Hugh Harrelson organized the Phoenix contingent of the Save Journalism movement, and Jan raised the money to build the first serious computer lab in the journalism department at the time, which enabled us to transform the curriculum so that we could prepare students for the incredible technological advances and challenges that would confront the, the profession. The Journalism Advisory Council, led by Don <coughs> Solweedel and Luda Solweedel, who after him provided enormous financial support for the school because she believed in the mission that we had. The other members of the Journalism Advisory Council, Peggy and John Rowley, Nancy Guthrie, Frank Sotomayor, who was one of the early leaders of the council, have all been invaluable. And all of us who are being inducted into, into the Hall of Fame 
there are people that we need to thank for helping us pour our lives and our hearts into this mission of preserving the free press and its importance to democracy. We have parents who supported us. We've heard about brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, siblings, significant others. And I, I would like to say that one of the people that I need to thank from the bottom of my heart is my beloved companion of 34 years, Professor Emeritus of Physics, Optical Sciences, and International Affairs, William Wing. From the time I was going to Central America in the 1980s to spend months doing investigative reporting that led to government resignations and investigations, every year, Bill, who had a master's in computer science, would build me the latest type of laptop, which was in its infancy, laptop computing, I mean, this was, this was the dark ages in computer technology. He would build me a new machine every year, and before I got on that plane to be gone for three to six months, he would hand it to me, and he would say, go get him. And when we got the space in the Marshall Building, after many years in the, <laughs> yes, uh, hazardous uh, Franklin Building basement, when we were given the space in the Marshall Building, that's what we got from the university initially, was space. Oh yeah, you can have a couple thousand square feet on the third floor, but we're gonna put in uh, cubicles for you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We have hundreds of students to teach. You are going to build rooms for us. And they said, really? So Bill, who had built computer and research facilities at Yale and here at the U of A, downloaded another copy of DraftSite and designed the entire floor right down to the data wiring. So if you go over to the building today to see the unveiling of the plaque, every classroom that you see, every seminar room, every computer lab, he designed them from scratch, and then we made the university build them. And because of his vision about how journalism was going to evolve, how the technology was going to evolve, the curriculum has been able to keep pace with technological change because he made sure there was data wiring to every computer, the hundreds of computers in our laboratories, there was data wiring to the desktop. That was a hell of a fight because the university wanted to put a hub in the middle of each classroom and then we could sort of patch it all together. So those of you who are students, what I can say is you are in the right place if your idea is facts are important, truth is important, democracy is important, and citizen participation in their own government Governance is important. I would say to you, the students who are here, welcome to the front lines of the information war. You're in a place where that's been our mission for the past 50 years. Thank you. Wow. I am fired up. Is anyone else feeling that right now? Like, my heart is beating faster. My gosh. No, I gotta take a breath. Woo! That was amazing. Thank you. All right, now let us honor the late couple that you just referred to, Donald and Lou Edith Luda Soldweedle. Don and Luda helped lead the Save Journalism Committee after U of A officials recommended the department be closed in 1994. Don, who started Western News and Info and owned small newspapers in Arizona, became chair of the school's new advisory council and shaped its fundraising role. After he passed in 2008 at 83 years old, Luda increased their annual gift to cover the school's operations expenses. After she died in 2016 at age 90, their lifetime gifts converted to an endowment to benefit the school for years to come. Accepting on their behalf, our grandchildren, Brett and Kelly Soldweedle, both executives with Western News and Info. Brett and Kelly. Okay. Well, following Jacqueline, 
That was amazing. Um, you all have just wonderful resumes. It's just incredible what we're even doing here. So um, my dad was not able to make it today, so he did have a little something he wanted uh, us to say. Uh, he said, Don and Luda's daughter Anne, grandson Brett, granddaughter Kelly, U of A grad 03, right here, uh, and son Joe, U of A grad 74, gladly accept this award, inducting them. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, inducting them into the university's Hall of Fame. Don and Luda are most deserving of this distinguished honor. Don gave his time tirelessly to the university's journalism school. While Don and Luda were generous financial contributors to the school as well, uh, writing checks was just not sufficient enough for Don, which resulted in his regular J school presence. Ask Jackie Sharkey is what my dad wrote right here. So Jack, he called you Jackie. Sorry, Jacqueline. But yes. <laughs> so yes, he, he was really, he frequented the, the school there. So that was wonderful. Don and Luda both graduated from U of A, held a steadfast and deep love for and dedication to the university and Tucson for their entire lives. So it's really, really special that we're here today. So thank you so much. Um, and then, you know, Brett and I just feel really fortunate that we're fourth generation here in the, you know, Solid Whittle family doing community newspapering and continuing to have quality journalism in all of our community newspapers throughout the state of Arizona. And that's thanks to, you know, just such a wonderful journalism school that U of A has. So we're so fortunate. So thank you so much and bear down. Yeah. You want to say anything else? I've had the, uh, the pleasure of serving on the Journalism Advisory Council with our next honoree, Frank Sotomayor. Uh, Frank is a 1966 graduate, and he went on to become an editor at the Los Angeles Times, where he co-led a series on Latinos that was mentioned earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, that series won the 1984 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service Journalism. Uh, an early leader in news media diversity, he co-founded the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education and CCNMA, the Latino Journalists of California. Uh, Frank helped sa save the school from closure in mid-1990, and he has chaired our advisory council for the, the last few years. And that's why I attend every meeting, is to make sure. He keeps wanting me to uh, uh, succeed him as president, and I have to uh, attend the meetings to make sure that doesn't happen, because I, <laughs> I, I'm not capable of walking in his shoes. But uh, Frank Sotomayor, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'd like to say, John, that the only reason we really want you on the advisory council is for the uh, eye candy. You're, you're good. <laughs> you're good, John. What a wonderful day. This is the day of celebration. I congratulate my amazing fellow Hall of Fame inductees and the families of the inductees. And I thank Dave Couliar, Mike Chesnick, Bobby Joe Buell, and others responsible for putting together this fabulous event. And I really want to acknowledge family. This is a day of giving thanks and to acknowledge my wonderful parents, now deceased, Amelia and Florencio, who persevered through very hard times of depression, homes that burn, my mom's crippling arthritis, a combination of only about eight years of education between them, to raise a wonderful family. And I want to thank my siblings and all of my relatives who have supported me. I was a baby of a family, and they all helped me and inspired me through my entire life. My wife, Dr. Barbara Sotomayor, an educator, has made my return to Tucson a very special and beautiful experience. I want to recognize my brother Ramon and wife Gina my son Stephen, his wife Lindsay, and daughter Nova. Nova, my first grandchild. Yes. <laughs> she will be a third generation wildcat. She is already wearing the little uh, cheerleader outfit. And I also want to thank others who are here today, Mark, Annette, 
Debbie and Brian. And I'm sorry that my daughter Teresa could not attend today, but I thank every one of you who is here. Thank you for being here for me. For me, this is a day of memories. Jacqueline Moore, many others have talked about the serious state of journalism today, and I could go on on that too. But let me just permit me to tell you just a, a few stories, a few remembrances. Let me go back 62 years to a Saturday morning in Tucson when I was about 12 years old. I had finished my job doing yard work at 9th Street and Olson, and as was, my, as was my routine, I jumped on my bike to ride back to my home in Barrio Hollywood. But first, I took Cherry Avenue North and entered the U of A campus, the distinctive red brick buildings, the swaying palms, and the young men and women carrying textbooks form an intriguing image in my mind. There was something truly special about this place, I thought, but I quite couldn't figure it out what it was. I wondered if perhaps someday I might possibly part, be part of this university. In that same year, my ambitions to become a professional baseball player came crashing down in a harsh reality. Even in Little League, I couldn't hit a curveball, <laughs> or a fastball for that matter. So my career plans were put on hold. Luckily, down the street at Tucson High School, my English teacher recommended that I do sports writing for the school paper under journalism teacher Harriet Martin. I started doing that, and I also became a sports stringer for the Arizona Daily Star. I loved it. I loved being in the newsroom, the people, the whole process. I loved seeing the byline, and I love informing people. I decided to major in journalism at the U of A, and again, I was very lucky. Sherman R. Miller III became my favorite professor and my mentor. I cannot say enough about the knowledge, the assistance, and the inspiration that I gained from Mr. Miller. Anytime I had a question as Wildcat editor, I was able to go to him for advice, and he would provide that, and also probably tell me a few New York Times stories while he was at it. He insisted, while I resisted, that I apply to Stanford for a master's degree. I'm very happy that he did that and that I got a full scholarship and a degree. Working on the Daily Wildcat was magical. Working with Mort and Nan Durando and many others was one of the most memorable periods of my life. That is where I met Mary Gay, who later became my first wife in a marriage lasting 40 years. Mary passed away in 2009, and a journalism scholarship today bears her name. I am truly honored to be inducted on this day, knowing that I am receiving this recognition on the same platform as my beloved mentor, Mr. Miller. To the family members of Mr. Miller's, I say, thank you for your wonderful dad and grandfather. I am grateful to all my teachers and mentors, who also included Phil Mangelsdorf, Brewster Campbell, and my dear friend, Don Carson. They all helped me to build a solid foundation to succeed, not only in journalism, but also in life. A few people have mentioned an important moment in the history of the journalism school. In 1994, President Pacheco and the provost recommended and were ready to eliminate, to abolish the journalism department. And it was only because of the support of many of you, alums, faculty certainly, and friends of the school, that the department was saved. And as they say, never argue with somebody that buys ink by the barrel. And President Pacheco said to me when we met with this distinguished group of journalists from around the country, he said to me, I've never in my life as an educator had 1,200 people write to me for one cause, and you were able to do that. So that shows the, the strength and the love that people have 
for journalism at the University of Arizona. Working for 35 years at the LA Times as an editor, I faced many challenges and I had many gratifying moments. The series of stories that stand out most are the ones that we, all of us Mexican Americans, and three of us from the University of Arizona, initiated and produced on the Latino population of Southern California. That series was in, about investigation, but at the end, it was really about erasing ugly stereotypes about Latinos who had been considered the other and recognizing the diversity of our communities. That our series won the Pulitzer Prize was a gratifying uh, redemption to our work that our editor-in-chief at one time did not want to even nominate for a Pulitzer. Now I'm back in Tucson. And I couldn't stay away from newspapers. Call me really crazy, but I volunteered to do what I did when I started in journalism nearly 60 years ago. I'm a sports freelancer, a stringer for the Arizona Daily Star. Oh, the stories aren't that good, come on. I'll be covering the track meet today, this afternoon, and I'm very sorry for that reason I won't be able to join the inductee families at the school later today. And I'm still wondering, by the way, maybe Bobby Joe, a former editor at the Star, knows, are they going to pay me more than they did in 1962? <laughs> the pay then was uh, a lofty 10 cents per column inch. Okay, so I am back. And I love working with the School of Journalism on the Advisory Council. It's vital that each of us, each of you, continue to support the School of Journalism. With the press, the news media now under the attack, our journalism faculty are preparing students for what today is even a more challenging and important job. And for me now, returning to Tucson, returning to this campus of red brick, and swaying palms, I appreciate once more the qualities and the contributions of a special school of journalism and special university. Thank you very much. Lastly, we honor the late Bill Walsh, who was a 1994 or 1984 graduate uh, of the University of Arizona School of Journalism. Bill, uh, this, is, this is a very special presentation to me because Bill was my copy chief uh, at the Arizona Daily Wildcat. And he had this knack for making me feel stupid without making me feel stupid. Uh, <laughs> He's quite honestly one of the most brilliant editors I've ever worked with. Uh, Bill was a witty author of three copy editing books, including Lapsing into a Comma, the Elephants of St and The Elephants of Style. Bill was a copy chief at the Washington Post for two decades and started a renowned website for copy editors in 1995 called theslot.com. He received the American Copy, Editors, uh, American Copy Editors Society's top honor and helped edit numerous Pulitzer Prize winning projects at the Post, including a series on NSA surveillance in 2014. Some of us are still trying to process the fact that he was uh, taken from us much too soon. The only thing I can think of is that way up in that uh, great newsroom in the sky, the editor-in-chief uh, must have needed a hell of a copy editor. <laughs> Uh, with us today is his widow, Jacqueline Dupree, who will accept his award, and members of Bill's family are here as well. Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, first off, I want to say that um, Bill would have been so thrilled that uh, the inaugural class uh, of the journalism, School of Journalism Hall of Fame includes a copy editor. <laughs> and he would have been even more thrilled that that copy editor is him. Um, the University of Arizona, the Daily Wildcat, meant so much to him. 
and not just because he met one of his longest and dearest friends, um, but it launched him. Um, I found in going through his library of books, um, the dictionary that he received in 1984, I believe, when he won the Haddich Award, still with the piece of paper inside. Um, he went from here to the Phoenix Gazette, and I found the letters that uh, the editor of the Gazette first offering him the internship while he was still here, and then the full-time job. Then, as I said, he went to the Washington Times, um, and then on to nearly 20 years at the Washington Post. Um, and I think that anybody who knew Bill, who worked with Bill, who saw what he grew into for, through his years with the slot and through his published books was that not just language was in his blood, but the use of it to do what this group of people of what journalism wants to do, which is to inform the public. And I think what became Bill's most important goal, uh, role at the Washington Post, and it was a role I think that most people at the Post, where I've also worked for nearly 20 years, didn't necessarily grasp until they lost him, which was that he was the keeper of standards in that paper. At a time when everything had to be done faster, with fewer people, and with very little margin for error, he was the one kind of standing astride. Uh, I know a lot of reporters feel that copy editors' main goal is to destroy their perfect prose. Um, <laughs> but Bill was a tireless advocate within the Washington Post for making sure that just because the delivery of journalism had changed over the years, that the standards of journalism remained the same. Um, and so I think one of the greatest uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, I think it's a real testament to him that every day now at, at the Washington Post on that copy desk when they are faced with the evening's onslaught, um, the rallying cry is, what would Bill do? And so on behalf of his family who's here today, which includes his two copy editing brothers, Kenneth and Terrence, and his mother Molly, and his sister Jen, and his stepfather Gary, and his niece and nephew, and from me, I just would really like to thank the Journalism Advisory Council and everyone for recognizing him for his life's work and that it comes from a place that meant so much to him over the years. So thank you very much. That was beautiful, thank you. Well, that concludes today's ceremony. One more round of applause, please, for all these amazing inductees. <laughs>